Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. Um, I've just been um, having a bit of a break from videos um, in the last little while, kind of a sabbatical or rest just to recharge the batteries. And, uh, you know, the main thing was that my kids were home uh, and uh, we all went to work uh, doing uh, some major uh, house renovations, mostly painting, etc. So I needed a uh, break. <coughs> And uh, essentially all that stuff is finished. So, you know, when you have a house that was built in 1911, then, um, you know, it's, it's over, you know, well into the antique years. And, uh, you know, if you're a house owner, you know that uh, there's constant maintenance that's required. So uh, anyway, um, and uh, so I'm getting heavily back into videos in the next little while and I'm doing a lot of preparation because I'm going to the climate conference in uh, about five weeks it starts um, and it's Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt and um, I want to thank Heidi for setting up a GoFundMe page to uh, you know help offset some of the costs of the trip and uh, you know, I'll post links to it, etc. soon. In the time I've been gone, you know, you can see this climate poster at the back. All hell breaks loose. We're, seems like we're kind of in that stage. Um, so in this video, what I'm going to focus on is the recent uh, hurricanes. Uh, the Hurricane Ian, of course, you know, which uh, hit the U.S., um, hit Florida, you know, Fort Myers area, caused a 15-foot storm surge and huge devastation as bad as it was it was lucky that it was it veered um it was heading for the built-up area of tampa a day or two before but it hit further south uh, in the fort myers region if it had hit tampa you know as bad as damages were it, they would have been much much more severe um if it had hit you know much higher density population region of course uh you know people in the maritimes in canada are still recovering from hurricane fiona um and it was one of the largest storms to hit the maritime provinces um came into uh you know into into nova scotia crossed over you know hit pei tremendous damage there and also into Newfoundland and uh, you know this was a very powerful storm. I'll show you the characteristics of that storm and also of Ian and most people are probably not even aware of the typhoon that hit the Philippines um, about the same time or just before uh, Hurricane Fiona. So talking a little bit about you know how climate change is intensifying hurricanes it's uh, decreasing the return period, um, the amount of energy in these storms, the, the accumulative energy over the season as the hurricane season proceeds is much, much higher. Individual storms are much stronger and often they're moving slower. They're often guided by, um, by well, they're guided by the uh, prevalent wind patterns the Coriolis force deflects them to the right in the northern hemisphere, but they're often pulled to troughs of jet streams, etc. So Fiona, for example, would have missed the Maritimes. It would have veered to the right and out to sea, but it was sucked into an upper level trough. Um, one of the wavy um, troughs of the very, very buckled and convoluted jet stream, which has slowed and become much wavier in the north-south direction because of the greatly warming Arctic. And of course, the Arctic's warming four to five times faster than the rest of the planet. So that lowers the temperature gradient to the equator. So the jet streams, which depend on that temperature gradient to exist even, um, are moving slower and they're much wavier in the north-south direction. Um, and also we're seeing sea surface temperatures much, much warmer than normal because of abrupt climate system change. And this is fueling uh, powerful storms, more powerful 
hurricane. So I'll, t I'll, I'll show you all of these details. I'll go through Climate Reanalyzer, I'll go through Earth Null School, and I'll show you these details uh, but, uh, um, as, we, as we proceed. So let's go back to uh, my computer screen here. Just hang on a second. Okay, so this is an article. Um, this is from an article, the Washington Post, and I'll talk a bit more about that article later on, but I just wanted to show you this image here. So category four and five U.S. Gulf Coast landfalls since 2017. Um, so we had Harvey here, category four, 130 mile per hour winds, a central pressure of 937 millibar. The wind speed um, is correlated, of course, directly to the the lower the pressure in the eye, the higher the winds in general, but it also depends on the storm size and other conditions. Of course, this storm um, basically stalled on the coast of Texas, and uh, it marched up. It, it, it dropped as much as five feet of rain in some regions. Its speed along it, it was half over the water, half over the land. The land was saturated, so it was like a, 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 a you know, all that water on the land was evaporating, and that kept the strength uh, up. And it basically moved about one mile per hour at times along the coast, dumping huge amounts of rain, causing tremendous damage. Um, and of course, here's Laura, category four, 150 mile per hour winds, um, 939 millibars. So the pressure wasn't quite as low, wind speed was higher. And this has to do with the idea that this storm was much, much larger size than Harvey. Here's Ida, um, 150 mile per hour winds, 931 millibar pressure. Um, and it's uh, similar in size to Harvey. Of course, we had uh, Hurricane Michael, Category 5, with 160 mile per hour winds and a 919 millibar pressure. That's the lowest of, of all of these storms since 2017. Um, and then there was Ian, um, of course, uh, which we've just had, Category 4, 150 mile per hour winds, 940 millibar pressure. So you can compare the winds here to here to here being all the same and the pressure, um, you know, the size of Ian here, similar to, to Laura there, um, similar pressures. Um, and because Ida was more compact, the, uh, the eye was a lower pressure. And then of course there's Irma, which was a category 430 mile per hour winds, 931 millibar pressure. Okay, so pressure very, very low. It's very compact, tight eye. Okay, so, um, and uh, you can also see um, that, um, yeah, so basically, uh, you know, the waters here in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, extremely warm. And as long as the water temperature is over 26.5 degrees Celsius, then as these storms are passing through, they, they gain intensity. And if they're moving really slow, they can do some self-quenching if the sea surface temperature um, is, um, if there's enough churning in the water to bring up colder water from below. But often with what we're seeing now is that the water column is warm down to significant depths, down a couple hundreds of hundred a meet, hundred meter, two hundred meters. So when a hurricane is moving slowly across that water, it does churn water in the water column, but the water is warm down to significant depths. So that warmer water comes up, and the hurricane is still not. It's not self quenched if it's moving slowly across the the ocean. There also the jet streams are slower and wavier. So these storms are often stalling out and not moving as fast. So if they're over one region for longer periods of time, they can cause tremendous damage. Okay, so I'm talking about all of these storms. This is the article here from the Washington Post, how climate change is fueling, rapidly fueling super hurricanes. So actually, let me, let me, um, let me talk about this article 
now um, since I've got it up. So this is some of the damage. Um, this is Fort Myers where it hit, Fort Myers in Florida, damage home and debris. So most of these homes, you know, end up being washed away. I mean, the storm surge, you know, rising, uh, you know, they thought it would be 12 to 18 feet. It was about 15 feet. I'll show you a video and it came right up, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of the homes floated off and, uh, you know, the water, the waves and stuff pounded against them. So you can see, you know, it looks basically like a war zone. So, you know, hurricanes, uh, climate change is, is, um, it's making hurricanes a lot worse. Okay, the bigger storms are more intense and they're moving more slowly over the surface. So they're causing tremendous water, uh, tremendous, um, you know, damage from the winds and from the, the, the storm surge and the uh, pounding waves. Um, the slow move, slower movement of storms like Ian, you know, stems from climate change. It gives them a greater opportunity to strengthen and destroy as long as day-to-day -day conditions remain ripe, it says. Okay, so um, since 2017, an unprecedented number of storms rated category four or stronger have lashed the U.S. shoreline. So Harvey, Irma, Maria, Michael, Laura, Ida, and now Ian, they all qualify as rapid intensification events. That's when the storm's wind speeds increase by at least 35 miles per hour within 24 hours. Okay, so 16 of the 20 hurricanes over the past two seasons in the Atlantic Basin have undergone rapid intensification, according to this criteria of an increase in storm wind speeds by at least 35 miles per hour within 24 hours especially in the near coastal region where the hurricane is just ahead of landfall, we're seeing this intensification rate ramping up. Uh, Ian was only the latest case when its winds nearly doubled within a 24 hour period. It went from a low end hurricane with sustained 75 mile per hour winds, that's basically category one, that was on a Monday, to a category three storm with 125 mile per hour winds on Tuesday. Then as it approached Florida on Wednesday, its wind surged even faster, going from 120 miles per hour around 2 a.m. to 155 miles per hour by 7 a.m. So that's a 35 mile per hour increase in five hours. Um, if it does that 35 increase in a day, in 24 hours, that's called rapid intensification. So this is super, super rapid intensification. It did it in five hours, not 24 hours, that increase of 35 miles per hour. Um, and, uh, you know, you can compare uh, the, seri the, the number of hurricanes striking the U.S. since 2017 um, to previous time periods. There were a number of storms from 1945 to 50. There were five category four hurricanes hitting Florida. Um, so, you know, is 2017 uh, the, the increase, the number sent unprecedented? Um, in terms of damages, it certainly is because of the densification. This is just a, you know, you can, you can just easily, you know, look at various websites and see, you know, striking images of, the tremendous damages, you know, of this storm and also of, of Fiona. Um, a period of rapid strengthening is almost a prerequisite for a storm to become among the most powerful hurricanes, at least in Florida, because they, they're amplified in the, in the Gulf um, and in the Caribbean. Um, so one study that was published earlier this year, peer-reviewed scientific study, it found that since 1990, there's been a steadily growing number of global tropical cyclones that have undergone this extreme rapid intensification. Um, another study from 2018 focused on the Atlantic Basin found that cyclones that have strengthened, that among cyclones that have strengthened the most rapidly, the rates of intensification has accelerated, growing by about four miles per hour each decade over the past 30 years. Now, it's important to remember that these storms, are, you know, the pressure is low in the center. 
So air goes in, deflects to the right in the northern hemisphere because of the Coriolis force. So the storms are all rotating this way around the low pressure area. The storm also has its forward movement. So the wind speed here, you need to add the rotation speed with the forward motion speed. So if the rotation speed is 150 miles per hour and the storm's moving 10 miles per hour, this the wind speed there will be 150 plus 10 or 160 miles per hour in the front right quadrant. And in the front left quadrant, you need the rotation is this way and the mo motion is this way. So the wind speed there will be the 150 minus 10, which is 140 miles per hour. So 140 miles per hour on this side, 160 here. Most of the damage clearly is in the right front quadrant. Most of the rainfall is in the um, is in the uh, is is in the left quadrants. Okay, so here you know Tampa was in the you know up in the left quadrant. It's got most of the rainfall, but most of the damage was in this area. Most of the storm surge is in this area as well. Okay, um, the I the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the most recent assessment. Uh, had this conclusion also. Tropical cyclones are becoming more intense and they're becoming, they're prone to more rapid, quick intensification. So, you know, as they're crossing the ocean, if they're intensifying much more rapidly, they can uh, go move quickly from tropical storms to category one, all the way up to category four, three, four, or five. Uh, in a matter of a few days. So it becomes much more difficult to anticipate and prepare for them. One of the most worrying things about climate change is the change in extremes, of course. You know, this rapid intensification is a process that fits that category of, of extreme. If a storm in the Caribbean Sea, for example, four decades ago intensified, intensified by 34 miles per hour in a day, that same storm would increase by about 48 miles per hour in today's climate, just because the sea surface temperature is much, much warmer. And often there's a lot less vertical wind shear, which tends to um, prevent storms from, from gaining strength. Um, climate change is responsible for increasing Ian's extreme rainfall rates by 10%. This is some preliminary analysis of Ian's rainfall. A hotter ocean, along with low vertical wind shear, have helped drive the rapid intensification of recent storms. And I'll use Earth Null School and Climate Reanalyzer to show you some of these conditions like sea surface temperature. In recent decades, the oceans warmed at record rates because of human emitted greenhouse gases making this threshold, you know, which is 26 and a half degrees Celsius, uh, 79 Fahrenheit, they say here. Um, you know, uh, you know, Cuba sea surface temperatures were 86 degrees, much, much warmer. Um, you know, and as bad as the, you know, Hurricane Ian was knocking out power to two and a half million people, um, the hurricane passed through when it, the, when the hurricane passed through Cuba, it knocked out power to the entire island. It's 11 million people. Um, Prince Edward Island was pretty much knocked out of power almost completely. Nova Scotia, big chunks of Nova Scotia knocked out of pa power was out from these storms. Generally, um, in the Northern Hemisphere, leaves were still on a lot of the trees. So the high winds brought down branches and trees which uh, fell on power lines and knocked down power lines or the poles were just toppled in the high winds, um, you know, without, even without the trees hitting them. Rising global air temperatures also mean that waters, especially in bodies like the bathtub-esque Gulf of Mexico are warming beyond just their surface. Okay, they're warming to deep depths. The deeper the wa that warmth goes, the more fuel can flow to a slow moving storm like Ian. So it doesn't self quench. The warm seawater evaporates, pumps moisture into the air that can recondense into storms, clouds, and rain. So here's, uh, you know, this is showing a storm surge coming up. Remember that in hurricanes, by far the most of the damage is from storm surges. 
this is Hurricane Harvey in Houston. Um, this is uh, near, uh, this is the Category 4 Hurricane Michael in the Florida Panhandle, October 2018, the damage caused. You know, I have to ask, you know, with these storms happening more and more frequently, with more and more intensity, more and more damage, you know, we're not always going to have money to rebuild. So, you know, what happens when the costs from abrupt climate system change, extreme weather events um, occurs too often for us to rebuild regions, then there'll be sort of, uh, you know, retreats from the coastline, right? And certainly people won't be able to get insurance from the coastline. So having structures and living along coasts will become far too expensive for, for most people to live. You know, so if the water is warm to great depth, the storm can sit over this warm water for days. If it's deep enough, the storm's not going to kill itself. It's not going to use up all of the warm water, end up uh, exposing itself to uh, cold water coming up, and then reducing intensity. Vertical wind shear, which are changing wind speeds and direction at different altitudes, is a key influence on the intensity of hurricanes. High wind shear can weaken a hurricane. Weaker wind shear can help a hurricane form and strengthen. Wind shear has been relatively low in the Western Atlantic since 2017, a factor that's contributed to the flurry of tropical cyclones since then. It's possible that in the long run, climate change can make this environmental condition more common. The jet stream, um, if it's you know, it creates strong wind shear, but if it's slowing down or if it's being pushed northward as global temperatures rise, then, you know, it'll be in different regions. And so you need to look at a particular region to see what's going to happen. And you can accept, expect that things that are, that are sort of running out of control right now uh, will continue to, to sort of run out of control. It's sort of, uh, you know, as the climate shifts, as the uh, jet streams shift, as the ocean currents shift, you know, heat try, you know, the Earth is a big heat engine moving heat from the warm equator to the cold poles, and we're undergoing abrupt climate system change. So as this change is occurring, um, we, uh, you know, we pass, there's a lot of uncertainty in, in, in the, you know, what will happen in one particular region. Um, but climate change is it's definitely increasing a hurricane's potential for intensification and therefore destruction by slowing them down, increasing the duration of damaging winds and flooding rainfall over a particular region. So, for example, when Hurricane Ian took a similar path and with a similar intensity as Hurricane Charlie in 2004, Charlie blew into Florida at 20 miles per hour well, Ian only moved 10 miles per hour. And I said Harvey, you know, was only moving a couple miles per hour. So Ian dumped as much as 20 inches of rain along its path. More than, you know, according to early estimates, already more than twice Charlie's rainfall. This is, uh, so the, the storm's slow movement may stem from rapid warming at Earth's poles, because this has narrowed the gap in temperature and pressure from the poles to lower latitudes. You know, it's it's much more than a hypothesis, it's just logic 101. These differences in temperature drive winds around the globe, pushing around weather systems, including hurricanes like quirks in a stream. So when they're minimized, this may be causing a broader slowdown in global weather systems. The same phenomena, the jet streams much wavier than usual, getting stuck, getting into blocking situations, is causing abnormal spells of extreme heat and blasts of polar frigidity because the jet stream winds that normally break up weather patterns and drive storm systems are weaker. They're getting stuck in, play, in place. It just seems like the whole atmosphere is getting more sluggish and therefore storms that are carried in are moving more slowly. Slower moving storms are capable of dropping enormous amounts of rain. And here we go, Hurricane Harvey showered more than 60 inches of rain in some parts of south southeastern Texas because it stalled over the region for nearly two days. You know, I think it was more like three or four days, uh, but 60 inches, five feet of rain in some places. If a storm bearing hurricane force winds remains over one spot for long enough, 
eventually it's going to flatten everything. Plus, if it's on the coast, combining it with a storm surge, you know, you're just in trouble. You know, in the videos that, I, that you've seen probably, or I'll show you one of them probably in this video, uh, you know, the, the wave tops are actually sheared off because the wind speeds are so high. Um, and, uh, you know, the National Hurricane Center, it did signal fears about rapid intensification with Ian as soon as the storm developed. You know, well before it approached the Cayman Islands and Cuba, forecasters warned it would feed off warm Gulf of Mexico waters and become a major hurricane approaching Florida within five days. So our tools and our models are getting better. Okay, now I just um, use Twitter a lot. So I just looked at the hashtag hurricane and you can get the top news and the latest tweets on on this topic. Um, you know, Musk is providing Florida with Starlink satellites uh, to get people communication in the response to aftermath of Hurricane Ian. Um, you know, lots of uh, uh, articles here on the storm. Um, lots of images. Okay, uh, you know, here's the path of it you know, where it went through. So rapid intensification, you can, where the waters are the warmest. Okay, um, you know, just tremendous, tremendous damages. Um, if you go to the Hurricane Ian hashtag, um, you know, the key thing is that Hurricane Ian is not an, an anomaly. Climate disruption has changed the background conditions in which all weather occurs. The oceans and air are warmer, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere, and sea levels are high, higher. Hurricane Ian is the latest example. It's not an anomaly. Okay, um, at least 65 killed as death toll jumps in Florida. Um, yeah, it'll keep going up for a while. You know, lots of people sort of hunkered down in their homes, they didn't evacuate. And uh, this is a mobile home park. Just utter, utter, utter devastation. Um, and uh, yeah, just utter, utter devastation. Okay, before, after, you know, total destruction. It was a couple. Oh, this is the video. I should probably show you this video. Okay, so this is um, this is in Fort Myers. This is a time lapse, so you can see the water coming up the streets. Um, so as the the storm surge is increasing, it's coming up here to these trees, um, and you can just follow this video and see the you know this is just a camera on a pole. Uh, and they they created a time lapse out of it, you know, big big waves, uh, you know, huge winds, and you see this house starting to, you know, float away, be pulled off its foundations by the uh, the rising storm water. You know, just just uh, you know, horrifying images. You know, and this is uh, probably about a 15 foot storm surge. I don't know what the elevation is inland where this uh, camera is. But the other thing is, is you'll remember the building, the high rise that collapsed um, in Florida a while ago. Okay, so with this type of water going into the soils and sediments underneath these high rises, the ground becoming saturated. There can be some settling of the building over time and, uh, you know, collapse. So I think we're going to see a lot more high rises along the coast in Florida um, having huge problems and perhaps collapse if they're not um, reinforced or at least uh, monitored carefully to evacuate the building, um, you know, if there's shifting and problems. So just, uh, 
you know, we'll watch this to the end because I think they show, yeah, this is when the water had gone down. So completely scoured ground, the house completely washed away, you know, many, you know, the, so this apartment building, you know, what condition is it going to be in long term? Okay, so there's a lot of long term um, problems from from these type of storms. Okay, here's somebody's, uh, you know, nice windows and view out of their house. It's amazing. This thing is waterproof, but it's like an aquarium. Now you can see the fish swimming by or, um, you know, boats in your, in your front yard. Okay, it completely submerged uh, Sanibel Island, I believe. Um, and... Uh, Fort Myers Beach, you know, utter, utter devastation. Uh, I just want to show a couple. So this is a, uh, this is a week long tropical cycle of, of uh, Hurricane Ian and it shows you the, the path. There's a date and the time. So let's start at the beginning. Okay, September 23rd, whoops. Here, here it is here as it's moving through the Caribbean. Okay, 45 knots, so it's just a tropical storm, became category one, becomes more organized, a well-defined eye, category three here, as it's moving up and crosses uh, Florida. And then it re-intensified to category one before it went into uh, you know, other states in other Gulf states. And here's another image um, of it coming across, you know, very, very large and well-formed eye comes ashore, weakens, intensifies, the eye tries to reform. And then it comes into uh, South Carolina, I believe. Okay, so lots of uh, information here but this is certainly not an anomaly it's not an anomaly at all hurricane fiona um of course was canada the canada's the maritimes biggest uh storm and it washed away lots of the P prince edward island coastline um i'll sh i think i'll show you some of the things you can see satellite images of Prince Edward Island and the, uh, uh, you know, a friend of mine's from PEI. They have a couple cottages on the North shore that uh, suffered severe damage. Uh, oops, we lost it. I wanted to show that image, but it updated and disappeared on me. Um, Fiona. Yeah, okay, so that, anyway, there is an article on Prince Edward Island. The power was completely knocked out on Prince Edward Island. Um, some of the landmarks, very famous landmarks along the coast uh, were uh, completely, um, is it going to let me see the article? Yeah, okay, so that's, yeah, so here's, here's the coastline uh, before Hurricane Fiona and after, and you can see all of the, this is all sediment that's been washed out to sea and it's spread away from the island here. Um, there's pictures of, of beaches and so on. Um, I thought there was, uh, they're not in this article. It just has that one article. But if you look at coastlines, you can see they, you know, many places lost like 10, 10 meters, 20 meters of, of uh, the uh, coastline of sand sandbars and things uh you know cliffs you know it's completely completely changes uh the coastline and then of course there was typhoon nora which uh caused extensive damage in vietnam and also you know went through the philippines very strong storm uh but you know it was about the same time as uh hurricane fiona but it basically doesn't make the the news in the west um, this is showing a comparison between Ian, Hurricane Ian, and, Hurric and, and Typhoon, Super Typhoon Nora here. Um, and, uh, you know, very, very, lots of damage, 700,000 people affected, 
23,000 people displaced, 2,000 homes destroyed uh, in the Philippines from Typhoon Nora. You know, lots of damage in other countries there as well. Okay, but those, that's not even really even in the news um, because it's being overshadowed by, you know, these other major storms. Okay, so just climate reanalyzer. Um, today's weather maps, uh, this is just um, the two meter temperature anomalies. Okay, but what I really want to do is I want to show you, this is the uh, sea surface temperature. Okay, so you can see the very, very warm temperatures in the Caribbean, in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, uh, the red is uh, any, you know, any 26 and a half degrees and above the any any hurricane gains intensity. Those are the, all the red regions. So a hurricane in this region is going to gain strength and its motion is depict is determined by the Coriolis effect deflecting it to the right, where the jet streams are, if there's troughs, trade winds, etc. Um, but the water is extremely warm there. Look how warm the water is here. This, you know, when it's this warm, you have to worry about wet bulb temperatures exceeding the uh, um, ability of humans to withstand them on, on the coastlines there. Um, and this is up, this is in the Philippines, very, very warm temperatures. And uh, this is, uh, um, yeah, so it's a problem. Let's look at the sea surface temperature anomaly now. Um, so this is the um, anomaly from the 1971 to 2000 baseline. Um, and you can see, um, let's go back up here. So very, very warm temperatures here off the Maritimes. The water is cooled here, and this is because of the passage of Fiona, um, and very, very, uh, you know, very. It was very, very warm here, but it's cooled a bit because of the passage of Hurricane Ian, and um, over here, you know, very, very warm temperatures here, and here again, it was cooled a bit by the passage of Super Typhoon Nora. So this is present day. Um, and of course, you know, you can see, um, well, I guess it's, you know, what's key here too is colder than normal here. So we're still in a powerful La Nina and, uh, depending on where you are, the La Nina or, or El Nino, the warm version affects the conditions, uh, that you're experiencing where you, at your location. So you can just, uh, Google La Nina, look look at the Google images and see, you know, what the effects are on the region that you're in. Now, I just want to show you some uh, Earth Null School images. So this was, uh, this was Fiona, Hurricane Fiona, just as it was coming up to the Maritimes. Now, I'm just going to play the image here. So this is here, here it is here, and it's approaching, and then it came ashore into the Maritimes. Now, so it went straight or even leftward a bit. And because of the Coriolis force, we expect these things to deflect. So it was pulled over here by an upper level trough. So let's look at that. So here's a jet stream. Okay, uh, here's, a here's Nova Scotia up here. So, so Hurricane Fiona came up here and it was sucked over into the Maritimes by this very, very wavy jet stream. And jet streams are becoming much wavier, so a very powerful trough um, up at 250 hexapascals, uh, you know, the height up, up uh, ele at elevated heights where the jet stream is. So the upper level winds basically sucked Fiona in, into the Maritimes. If this hadn't been here, Fiona would have veered out over the Atlantic and actually completely missed the Maritimes. And this is the mean sea level pressure. And you can see where, where it is here and how it was actually pulled in by the jet streams, this trough. This is the waves. Um, this is 14 meter waves created here. 
um, you know, by this storm out in the ocean. So that's over, over, um, that's about 46 feet, you know, 46 approaching 50 feet high, um, the, the wave. This is the sea surface temperature. Um, uh, but if you go back, um, this is at the time of, of the storm being here. If you go back a little bit, okay, and look in this region here, you can see that the water sea surface temperature was much warmer, much, much warmer, but right here, very, very warm, right? So that's conditions perfect for amplifying, uh, you know, hurricanes and making them much more, much stronger, giving them rapid intensification. You know, as the storm passes through, it churned up enough of the water to remove that condition. Uh, so that's Fiona. This is uh, Hurricane Ian, um, just as it was about to come ashore. Um, and, uh, you know, we can look at the, uh, look at the sea surface temperature, you know, and we can go back a uh, couple days and see that it was much actually warmer. So Ian uh, caused some cooling. And this is uh, Super Typhoon uh, Nori coming through here. Um, and you can see that, you know, it's not affected by the jet streams. There's some slow trade winds here. It's coming. So you can see the passage, you know, and see why it's coming the direction it's coming in. So it's just coming across here this way. And you can see that that's because of the, the, uh, th this, this is a jet here breaking off coming this way. This is, this is high, high level winds. So it's kind of being pulled, pushed across this way. And this is the sea surface temperature. And you can go back a little bit and see it's much warmer. And then as the storm comes across, it actually, uh, no data there, but it actually cooled down a little bit here. Okay, so you can see all of these effects. Um, I just had a quick look, uh, you know, hurricanes and climate change, uh, you know, in Google, and you can find all kinds of connections. So this is the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. Warming sea surface temperature increases. So over the 39 year period from 1979 to 2017, the number of major hurricanes has increased with the number of smaller hurricanes decreasing. The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, predicts an increase in category four and category five hurricanes. So you can look at that. Sea level rise, of course, makes things worse on coastlines because on top of that you get the tides on top of that you get the storm surge so storms that hit um around 1900 you know um you know the sea the average sea levels risen over half a foot uh but the average nobody lives uh with the average in some regions on the on the coast of the east coast of the u.s it's risen more like a foot since 1900 so that means the equivalent storm now versus then is going to cause more damage because you have a storm surge on top of it. Um, changes in the atmosphere, the warming of the Arctic um, has contributed to other trends seen in the hurricane record. Hurricanes today travel more slowly than they previously did. Um, things stall out, right? Jet streams become stuck. Okay, the warming of mid-latitudes may be changing the pattern of tropical storms. Anyway, this is hurricane activity from 1950 to 2019. This is the accumulated cyclone energy. So if you take the energy, you know, as the hurricane season proceeds in a given year, you can add up all of the energy from each storm, and this is what you get. And what you can see is from about mid-1990, so now you have a lot more storms, a lot more years have more uh, cyclone energy, more energy, you know, bigger storms. Okay, so, um, you know, and the threats are larger, the intensification, uh, densification of people on coastlines is larger. All of these things are factors, you know, force of nature, hurricanes and a change in climate. This is a recent article this year. 
Um, it talks about what you need for a hurricane, warm ocean water, right? Climate change makes that warm ocean water in spades, lots of moisture in the air. If the ocean water is warm, the air is warm. The ocean water, there's a lot more evaporation and warm air can hold a lot more water vapor. In fact, 7% more for every degree Celsius rise in air temperature. Low vertical wind shear, which we've seen in the last, say, five years. So the storms aren't being broken up. And a pre-existing disturbance, like a cluster of thunderstorms, we're getting more of those. So perfect recipe for more and more storms of larger intensity. Okay, and uh, here's another article, how climate change makes hurricanes more disruptive. Same sort of thing. And uh, again, the Washington Post article is is excellent. Okay, so I'll, I I you know basically I just googled hurricanes, climate change, and you know it has the, the main links uh, listed there. So yeah, so basically, you know we're facing huge consequences from climate change that has already occurred. You know, average global temperatures only you know, 1.2 degrees warmer, right, than pre-industrial, and we're seeing all of these effects. So just imagine what effects we're going to see uh, when we're 1.5 or 2 degrees or even 3 or 4 degrees above pre-industrial, right? So climate change is rapidly accelerating and becoming much more of a threat to the continuance of societies. Um, anyway, thank you for listening and uh, I'll chat soon. Bye for now.